Well, Dennis, oh. do, do you think Alicia is going to be able to uh, join? Well, I, I think she's uh, her telephone number for some reason or other. She's not answering it, so we can't get ah. hold of her. But okay. uh, Neil has arrived. I don't know if he's going to join us now or what the story is. Yeah, um, I'm ready when you're ready. Neil, that was with Alex and Brandon. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. And hey, he hey, Neil. Hello. Hello, Neil. Mm -hmm. Is it? All right. So, Neil, can you just introduce yourself and just tell everybody, uh, especially for Kurt's benefit, um, who uh, who you are, what uh, you know, what you do, you know, and how you came about knowing about this, and um, and what inspires you about it, or whatever. Just brief. Well, how I met you, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my name is Neil Wilson, and uh, I run a, an ecological consulting company and con conservation logical company in South Africa and based in Durban, uh, and KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, we do work all over Africa uh, for governments, multinationals, small companies, big companies, mega, mega wealthy people like uh, Bill Gates and so on. And um, yeah, the the ethos of the company is uh, to respect, to value and respect nature. That's the that's our vision. And uh, everything that we do is basically revolves around environmental, environmental science, environmental management studies, uh, but specifically ecological specialist studies, aquatic, wetland, terrestrial estuarine, marine, sandy beach, and rocky floor, all the whole range of spectrum of ecology um, and conservation biology as well uh, for game reserves and um, uh, world heritage sites uh, around Africa, uh, you know, notably in South Africa. And uh, yeah, I've personally conducted about four, 400 specialist studies and uh, uh, quite a lot of experience. I've over 20 years of experience in, in the field. And uh, Lisa, who's we work together, uh, unfortunately we can't link up with her, but she uh, she has she's part of the company. And um, we we're going to be taking over a lodge in Zambia, and I'm going to be establishing a scientific research facility in uh, in Kafui National Park which is one of the oldest and biggest national parks in Africa at 30,000 square, kilometer, 30, square kilometers. And that's part of the Kavango Zambezi uh, Frontier Conservation Area, which is the biggest conservation area and wilderness area in the world at 530,000 square kilometers. So the, I will be focused on um, the Kapui National Park and on cars big problems, uh, ecological problems, elephant problems, lion problems, but all focused on humans, and humans are the main cause of the trouble. And so we get to think of novel solutions, but uh, as you probably know, the Botswana government has gone ahead with the trophy hunting auction and so on, which can cause, put the whole situation back about, I don't know, several generations of elephant, uh, which are being trophy hunted. And um, yeah, because they consider that, uh, uh, the elephant population in Botswana is too high, which is, it's not. It's, uh, Botswana has uh, sustained a far bigger elephant population in the past. Anyway, so that's the kind of work we do. Um, basically, the work we do is to protect nature. And look, uh, without, without humans, you can do nothing in terms of conservation and uh, protection of nature. You have to involve humans, unfortunately. Humans are very difficult to deal with. Uh, the most destructive species this planet has ever seen. And, but as Dennis convinced, when we met at a local sort of watering hole at midnight one night, and yeah, it was an incredible meeting. Um, because we basically share the same vision, and not necessarily the same vision, but the same vision um, of, um, of, of embracing love um, in, in terms of quantum quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics, quantum theory, uh, the force of action, um, going back to 
Newton's gravity. And yeah, so uh, we we try and embrace that. Dennis convinced me to to adopt that uh, uh, sort of conciliatory and loving approach rather than eliminating humans, which I was on a path to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about me. All right, thank you so much, Neil. So, um. Both, I, I actually feel like you know my contribution is like uh, compared to what you guys have just given me, which is uh, pretty magical. But um, let's just get back to the meeting. And so I, I'm just going to start as if we're starting now. So welcome to our 21st Help Save Our World meeting on food. Change the conversation and we change the world. Change what we eat and we change the world. Today we will continue talking about food from our experiences, thought journeys, and tell our stories about food. How can we help ourselves live healthier lives and help save our world by changing the food we eat? Does it matter what we eat? How does it matter? How does our diet affect us individually? How does it affect our environment? Which we are collectively manifesting as a re result of what we eat and what we drink. What should we watch out for with different diets? There's so many aspects. This understanding of how important what we eat is. Hello, I'm Dennis Moore. I'm the facilitator of this one hour meeting and your guide through this quest for the truth and transformation. I'm the author of three books and the creator of the Help Save Our World organization movement and this weekly online forum. Having spent my whole life on a quest for the truth and natural wisdom, I share this wisdom to open your minds so that you can see the, the world from a totally different perspective from what most of you have been conditioned to think the world is throughout your lives. I do this to empower you with the knowledge, skills and wisdom that you need to transform your life and to manifest a happy, healthy, sustainable future for all life on Gaia, Mother Earth. Let me just start with a section and then I'll give somebody else a turn and so on and we'll just rotate. All right. Let me take you on a food thought journey. Have you ever heard people say we are what we eat? Eat to live. Don't live to eat. And food is medicine. There are many, many things that are said about food, which are to some degree true. So instead of saying we are what we eat, we should say, what we eat does affect who we become in the world because we know that we are so much more than what we eat. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say we are physically what we assimilate, process, adapt and change within our bodies at any perceived moment relative to space. We are physically composed of everything that we assimilate into our beings, including the heat, and the sound and the light and all sorts of radiant energy. We know our bodies assimilate, ingest, digest, distribute, process, use and transform substances, cells and organs through many microbiological processes to create what we become at any perceived, perceived moment. These processes are happening all the time. So we are constantly changing as human beings. The sense of permanence is purely an illusion. We are purely process, but we are expressions of that which we assimilate physically and adapt and change and combine to become this expression of being and have to con continue that process. We have to continue to eat and to drink and to continue the processes and the balances and ultimately to live in harmony with all those processes. I mean, all these cells have to function together. And if they don't, then we have cancer and all sorts of problems. So to ensure that we have healthy lives as human beings and of course thrive. What should we eat? This is a big question to ask yourself and find answers to. Are we herbivores? Are we carnivores? Are we omnivores? Should you be a vegetarian, a pescatarian or vegan? What are the differences and how do they benefit our world that we manifest around us? 
a vegetarian is a person who does not eat meat, fish, and sometimes other animal products, especially for moral or religious or health reasons. This, this is from the Google dictionary. A vegan is a person who does not eat or use any animal products. So like if you've got a leather belt or leather shoes or whatever, then you're not a vegan. Um, you really have to, in every way, try not to do harm to animals and, and all forms of life. That is the vegan way. Uh, and ultimately, to eat a vegetable, fruits, nuts, uh, legumes diet. The uh, a pes pescatarian is somebody, I don't know if I pronounce that correctly, is somebody who doesn't eat meat, but does eat fish. So they're vegetarians that eat fish. Being a healthy vegan, now this is like, for, for me, I went on this incredible journey and I was like, okay, I'm gonna become a vegetarian and then I'm gonna become a vegan. And I made all the mistakes in the world. So becoming a vegan and staying a healthy vegan is not simply about eating as many carbohydrates and I'm gonna eat all potatoes, you know, because I don't like greens and I don't like carrots and I don't blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I'm just gonna eat all the carbos because, you know, I enjoy that. And I've just taken meat out of my diet. So now all I'm left with is potatoes. Eating the veggies you do like and not eating the veggies you don't like, that is a way to become malnourished very, very quickly. Or eating all of the processed soy, soy sausages and soy bacon and soy whatever. I tell you what, they came up with this whole big thing of soy. And at some stage, you know, when you're transitioning from meat, you feel like you've got to have that thing on your plate. So you decide, okay, I'm going to have soy sausages and I'm going to have soy steaks. And it's like 90 or 95% of soy produced in America is genetically engineered. And it's extremely unhealthy for you to have large quantities of soy. It has estrogenic substances in it and it affects you hormonally. So you find uh, young girls maturing too, too quickly. It affects menstrual cycles. It, it, it does a lot of damage to your hormonal level. I had a friend who worked at, there's a, a vegan restaurant going up US one, just from uh, up from sunrise and eventually eating a meal there every night. She, she eventually had such bad hormonal problems that she, she gave up her job and she left. Is that so, sublime? Sublime. Yeah, that's it. She's hmm. like, yeah, I can't carry on eating this, this because sublime has so much of the soy products in their restaurant. So when I began this journey, food and what I and what I drank, I began by drinking water in place of coffee and no cool drinks, the sodas. We call them cool drinks here and you call them sodas. I stopped all forms of stimulants like caffeine and de depressants like alcohol and all that sort of thing. So I just cleaned up my life and started to drink water. I made sure I ate no unnatural substances, things that have got preservatives and colorants and flavor enhancers and all of the synthetically manufactured food that you find in the central aisles of the supermarket. There's a, a story of an old lady saying, if you go shopping in a supermarket, shop around the edges because that's where you get all the fresh stuff. And down the central aisles, you just get all this processed garbage, which is generally made out of very few products that have been repurposed in so many different ways. As I went through that process is reading the labels and looking to see that it has no added alternative sugars, sucrose, as opposed to fructose, no corn syrup and no sugar substitutes like aspartame, which is poisonous to the human body and no dairy products and milk and cheese if you're a vegan. So I went through this whole journey of changing my diet and so on. But of course I made a lot of mistakes. I also became a whole fruit, fresh vegetable vegetarian, eating fresh fruits and legumes like green beans and raw nuts and vegetables uh, and fruit and so on. Then of course, cooking dehydrated foods only when necessary. I only broke the rule by eating fresh chicken eggs that were of course ideally raised to eat outside and, and eat really healthy food. And it's it just really an interesting thing. If you look at the eggs in South Africa, I can go and get you one and show it to you. They got a dark brown color and they got a thick shell. Most of the American uh, eggs manufactured in these egg producing facilities, they have this like paper white egg that you barely touch it and it breaks. It shows you the lack of calcium content and so the lack of the health of the bird in those big production facilities. 
Later, I went on to practice veganism for many years. That was because of empathy and my love of animals and for health reasons as well. And of course, you find you get so much lighter, you feel so much more energized. One of the big arguments is the silverback gorilla is a vegetarian, mainly, like almost 100% vegetarian. And it is like the strongest ape-like creature on this planet. And it develops muscle and all of that. So why can't we? And of course, many, many bodybuilders are changing to a vegan diet because they're healthier. They don't have heart problems. They don't have circulatory problems. They, they're just so much healthier. And they're, so, they're actually building incredible muscle and strength. A healthy diet also maintains nutritional balances, fruits, vegetables, carbohydrates, proteins, fibers, vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients, all supplied within a healthy, balanced food intake. You know, if you're just eating healthy foods, you get all of that stuff. Imbalances cause problems. Nutrient deficiencies and lack of fiber in processed foods, all of these things create problems. And a lot of our Western diseases are the result of that. A lot of genetically engineered foods that use poison genes. The whole idea is to control the plant life and the animal life, the weeds and the insects. And of course, our immunity is based on our microbiome within our stomach. And if we're eating this food that's got poison genes that kills that, we're destroying our immunity. And of course, that results in all sorts of other problems. So a good knowledge of plants, the seasons, the, the region, and how to grow them naturally is so important. All right, so who wants to be next? Dennis, uh, what I want to say, Dennis, <clears throat> in response to one of your first statements about whether we consider ourselves to be carnivores or herbivores or omnivores or fructivores or piscativores, whatever, that we passed that stage now. We can't, we can't decide what we want to be. We have to decide what the earth will allow us to be. Very oh. important, critically important point. Uh, the Earth cannot sustain 7.5, 7.8 billion carnivores. Impossible. The fisheries around the world have already collapsed because of China and the East, mainly China. The Galapagos is being invaded at its peak. And they've raped the oceans, they've raped the land, they've raped everything. The Chinese have. They devour everything. And I mentioned China because they are a principal problem in this world. They're not the only problem but they are a major problem. The next thing is that, for example, myself, I would say I want to be vegan. I'm, a, I'm an, a vegetarian, but an aspiring vegan. However, that comes with the constraints, not of liberal veganism or liberal vegetarianism. We are constrained what we can eat within a vegetarian or vegan diet. We cannot eat, um, just hypothetically, take a crazy example, uh, palm fruit, which I'm not sure if you can eat palm fruit, but it's just hypothetical. We cannot eat a crop, consume a crop. Sugar is a classic one that's destroyed ecosystems around the world, historically going back hundreds of years. And uh, same with palm fruit. And um, how many products on the shelves have vegetarian products, vegan products, contain palm Nobody should think of touching palm oil because it's, it's catastrophic impacts on ecosystems, destroying them left, right, and center all around the world in tropical areas, principally in Southeast Asia. The orangutans and many other species are hanging on the thread because of the destruction of tropical forest ecosystems, wetland systems, bug systems, etc. So I think my message is that whatever we choose, we'd have to be careful and we'd have to go for free range. You cannot treat animals in terms of factory for the, for the way the animals are treated currently with factory farming. It's inhumane. It's, it's absolutely barbaric what those animals do. through. It's, it's murder, actually. Uh, the dairy industry, killing calves at birth, ripping mothers away from their calves when they've just been born. Um, the meat industry, you know, we, are, we have a family farm in Botswana. And Botswana has one of the biggest abattoirs in the Southern Hemisphere. It's called, called the Botswana Meat Commission. They export meat to Europe and other parts of the world. I see the cattle in trucks coming to that abattoir. They are terrified. They smell death as they're coming to that abattoir. 
kilometers away. That is cruel. We cannot do that kind of thing to other species. What I would say to people who want to pursue that route, I will put you in a cattle truck and all your brethren. I will take you to an abattoir and we will execute you just like we execute the cattle. So all these things come into play. We've got to live, we've got to work with nature. And we've come to a state now where we're faced with the biodiversity apocalypse. It's well into that. We are faced with the sixth global mass extinction and it's human induced. It's totally human induced. The fifth being the, the uh, asteroid that hit the Bay of Mexico and Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago that eliminated the dinosaurs and 75 to 80% of the life on earth. Curiously and totally ironically, what survived that impact were small mammals. What do those small mammals become? They became us. What are we doing to the earth? We are destroying it. So you would have thought anybody with evolutionary biology as a, as a discipline or an understand, who has an understanding of that, take them back to that time. Mammals survived that very small primitive mammals survived that catastrophic impact, which eliminated what 75 to 80% of the iota of the earth. And now we're doing exactly the same, but we're doing it with humans. The technology at our disposal to live with nature, harmony with nature. We have it. We're exploring planetary ecosystems. We're exploring different planets, Mars, Jupiter. The, the probes are going out of the solar system to explore the rest of the universe. And yet we can't look after our own planet. That is ridiculous. We, can't, we, we don't even know what's in the seas, apart from the lack of fish because it's Chinese. Um, <laughs> but we haven't explored the depths of those seas. We don't know seas haven't been surveyed. You know when that uh, Malaysian plane went down uh, with all those people on board and nobody knows where that aircraft is? They had to survey the ocean floor to try and find that plane. They still haven't found it. Uh, so we know very little. We know very little about living ecosystems. We know very little about animals and plants in those systems. We are scratching the surface. So I'm just mentioning all these things because we know so little, but we need to work with nature so that we can learn more from nature. Mother Nature, we need to be part of, we, we're one of her, her children, and we're not acting like that. We're acting like a, a Xi Jinping of China uh, or a Donald Trump of the USA. We can't operate like that anymore. We are on a path to oblivion, literally. As an ecologist, I know that. Data is coming from in all over the planet. Global warming, pollution, the fish that you invest are largely made of, of are, are significantly made of plastic. Through instead plastic, um, you name it. The corals are dying all over the world. The extinction rate of species with the sixth global mass extinction is higher than the fifth when that asteroid hit the Bay of Mexico. Higher. In a, in a very short space of time, species that were around, like the northern white rhino in Africa, that were around uh, 100 years ago, that the population stretched from West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa. There are two females remaining because of the Chinese and the Vietnamese who've, who've gone after them ruthlessly for their horns because of their stupid beliefs in, um, in herbal medicine and cancer cures and aphrodisiacs. It's been proven that those horns are made of keratin, nails, uh, and they're chemically inert. Yet these people pursue this stupid, idiotic philosophy or approach to life or whatever. So we've got massive problems because, and the reason why I mention these people in the East, and it's not just them, it's in the West as well. We've got to convince people like that. You've got to convince, well, you can't work with, with criminals. You can't work with syndicates, um, criminal wildlife syndicates. The sole objective is to accumulate as much money as possible in a shorter time as possible by doing whatever is possible. Rhino, lion, elephant, pangolin, you name them. They're all on the, on the criminal syndic agenda because of money. So, Dennis, we, we, you're talking about a paradigm shift here based on love, right? And, and, and attraction and so on. But with that comes a whole huge spectrum of, of subcategories uh, you know, and, and basically it boils down to 
the human frailties of, of greed, corruption, short-term gains, whole suite of lethal human attributes. How are we going to get rid of those? Because by getting rid of those, are we going to be able to move to a new paradigm? I don't see it. I see that there's going to be a speciation of it. Humans will speciate. Those people who, like you all, Dennis, us here, we are different from the rest. We are different. We are different through our wisdom, through our education, through our understanding, through our experience. See the world differently. Whether you happen to be bipolar or um, dyslexic or whatever, or just an ordinary person who thinks very differently, we are different. They don't see that that way. I've had long discussions with people and talking about now specifically. You will never change those people because why? Because they know it all. They won't listen to advice. They all shut Can I down. Interject? They want to pursue their... Can I interject there? Yes. You know, the principle is if we give up now and we just say, okay, all right, too bad, nothing we can do and we'll just become extinct. But the possibility that we can make a difference and that we can turn things around exists. And the fundamental yeah. principle is if we change the way we raise our children, all right, if we come up with an education system that teaches this whole love, balance and harmony concept and re-educate our, our children within literally one generation of children, we can have a huge shift. Maybe five or six generations yeah. of children, we live in a totally different world. Yes, the existing people within this paradigm, we need a total re-education system. And of course, we're going yeah. to have to have in the beginning, like policing of, or ways of defending the elephants and defending our ecosystems. But those are, to me, what I consider the immediate short-term things that we have to do. Let's go back to yeah. the, 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 the concept of being a, a vegan or a vegetarian fundamentally that is the nature of who we are we've got hands to pick berries and to dig in soils and get tubers and so on we don't we don't have carnivorous teeth our um, long convoluted intestines in our stomach are different to carnivores a carnivore a lion has like yeah. from its stomach to its anus is a very short transition and the whole reason is to eradicate mm. the rotting meat quickly we're not designed to do that. So, um, so we're fundamentally designed to be vegetarians. All right. And if we're in a situation where we ultimately need to survive and there's only animals, it's like an ice age or whatever, and there's only other animals, we have that adaptability to be able to eat that to survive extinction. And then of course, each animal to raise a pound of flesh, and to raise enough vegetable to feed that animal to get a pound of flesh is a huge environmental cost to provide people yes. with meat. So and it's as well, eh? it's mainly energy. Yes, yes, yeah. it's, an, it's Financial an energy cost. cost. But exactly. So there's just a point that you brought up a little while back that you're going into these regions and they, they worried about the elephant overgrazing. There's an incredible video by Alan Savory where he literally culled 40,000 elephants in the... Um, Maybe National Park. I don't know if it was... Uh, he was an ecologist and he made that mistake thinking that the overgrazing was the problem. And in actual fact, what he discovered is um, having grazers is the reason why we uh, hold back desertification and so on. And the more grazers you have, the better it is for reintroducing nutrients into the soil and therefore propagating life and uh, spreading grasslands. So the whole idea is to use the, uh, all of the, the huge big herds, put them together in huge packs and, and drive them through, keep on driving them so that they don't overgraze. And, um, and predators can be used, uh, like in the Yellowstone National Park, they introduce predators back into the park and the ecosystems like reestablish themselves, the, the um, desertification and the, the erosion and everything all stopped by introducing a pack of wolves into, or wolves back into Yellowstone National Park. Um, so there, there is a need for this balance of predation and, and grazing. And mm. humans need to 
work in harmony with nature if we take those graces and we move them we we really and then live by growing in the areas where they have laid a carpet of, of humus um, of um, half fertilizer down then can grow crops and so basically it's it's a reintegration of the humans into those ecosystems with the aid of the herbivores and the predators so it, it's become it's really a regeneration of that ecology that's fundamentally important.